Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Miki Chaimovic and I'm a VP Business Development with the RSAP Vision, a global leader in computer vision and deep learning. Uh, for this webinar, I will host uh, Alan Jerusalmi, our VP Pharma. Hey, Alan. Hi, Miki. Hi, everybody. And we will be discussing computer vision and AI in Pharma. So a few words about uh, RSIP Vision. Uh, we are providing AI and deep learning solutions for image analysis. Uh, the solution is customized based on your project needs and your data set. Uh, as I say in each and every one uh, of those uh, webinars, uh, this industry is very far from standardization. Uh, so the chances that you'll find a product that suits your exact needs are pretty slim. Uh, we take a different approach. We start with you, with your project needs. We understand what you want to achieve. Then we have a look at your data set and then we customize and we tailor make a solution that is uh, uh, focused on your project needs. We've been doing that for over 25 years with multiple repeat clients in the USA. We have extensive experience in all AI and deep learning techniques in numerous medical applications, as well as experienced team of over 45 engineers located in Tel Aviv, Silicon Valley, and Boston. Uh, in addition to that, we have a medical team in staff to guide solution development, including radiology, pathology, and more. So the bottom line is, in case you plan to develop an AI solution, RSAP Vision is the safest, most stable way to do it. We have experience in broad range of AI applications. I'm not going to linger uh, over uh, all of them, but as you can see, we have experience in CT, X-ray, MRI, ultrasound, OCT, pathology slides, microscopy, and we've touched upon uh, many organs and many types of uh, tissues. A few words about uh, uh, our uh, AI solution development process. It starts with a proof of concept, and this is for two reasons. The first one is because, uh, uh, since again, this is not a standardized uh, a product, at the beginning of the process, we don't know what you need, Okay, so I can't possibly give you an estimation of the cost or the timeline. Okay, the other thing is that you know uh, AI is a buzzword, but people often find it hard to understand, you know, how can AI help me? So we're doing the proof of concept in order to show you something initial but, but real uh, as to how AI could be implemented in your scenario, in your case. And then it also enables us to learn more about your needs, about your data set, and estimate the, the timeline and the costs uh, involved. So we start when we sign a mutual NDA CDA. Then we define the parameters and deliverables that are needed from the POC. Uh, these would not be the parameters and deliverables of the complete solution. Again, this would be something initial, but enough for all of us to understand what we're talking about. And then the customer provides uh, samples. Uh, they don't, you don't have to provide a lot of samples, okay? Again, this is the POC. We can start small. We can start with a limited number of samples. And also, they don't have to be annotated. We can help you with the annotation. We can deal with that. With, we have a lot of experience. So even if you have a limited number of samples, uh, uh, it's not a reason not to pick up the phone and, and start the conversation. The next thing is that we develop the POC level solution based on the samples provided. Uh, this is an iterative process uh, that includes weekly discussions and updates regarding the solution development. It might take uh, a few weeks, uh, but once the POC is up and running, uh, we can show it to you. We can show it to the decision makers and the stakeholders in your organization, and and. and we can then uh, discuss the timeline and the cost. Once we have the green light, then we define the fully developed solution. Uh, RSIP, of course, develops it for you. And again, this is an iterative process that includes weekly discussions and updates. All in all, this process can take uh, uh, several months, but not too many of those. Uh, and at the end of the process, you can have an uh, up and running AI solution as part of your uh, drug development or drug discovery process in your pharma company. 
So the topic of our uh, discussion today is uh, AI and computer vision for uh, pharma. There's a lot of things we want to tell you, but we also want to listen and we want to hear you. Uh, so we encourage you to ask your questions uh, throughout the webinar, uh, now, later, uh, whenever you feel like it, and uh, send us more ideas or questions about other uh, applications of AI and computer vision uh, for pharma. And for this stage, I will ask uh, Alan to, to take it from here. Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mickey. I appreciate the intro. Okay, so before we jump in, uh, it's probably important just to do a quick highlight also. So a few weeks ago, we had a webinar where we talked about the do's and don'ts uh, for AI into pharma. So it's important to reiterate uh, some of the advantages that offer us. Uh, Mickey, you might want to advance the slides for me. Thank you. So um, what are the advantages of AI in image analysis? Well, first of all, we need to understand that the role of AI in image analysis is really to bring this application to a new level of technology and capability that wasn't available a few years ago. It really provides, and then to provide a support in all areas of drug discovery, as well as in clinical development. Once we have that, it's pretty clear to see some of the advantages that AI offers over traditional computer vision. And we covered a few in the past, but some of these, just to reiterate again, are we can do a faster solution development. Uh, and with that comes a much more efficient use of the technical expert. In the end, we are left with a much greater accuracy of the results that get generated by these AI solutions. And also it gives us the ability to tackle some more complex and challenging tasks that may not have been, um, we might not have been able to do previously. So before we jump too much into it, uh, it's important to highlight kind of the, the differences in steps that are involved in doing some of these machine learning algorithms versus your traditional or classical approaches for computer vision. So if we look at this example, we have, um, we're just looking at a pretty straightforward blood smear. And let's assume I wanna build a computer vision or an image analysis solution that will help segment and classify all of the lymphocytes, the neutrophils, and all the other blood cells available here. So if I'm using a classical approach, right, what do I need to do? I need to spend time with the expert in the field to really understand and have very well laid out rules for each one of those objects of interest. For example, the lymphocyte is gonna be of a certain size and diameter. It's gonna have a specific type of nuclei. The intensity is gonna be um, a very condensed uh, chromatin, for example, versus the platelet, which are much smaller. And for each one of these, we need very hard to find rules. Then a, a computer vision expert can take all of these rules and build a classifier and build the algorithm based on that. It looks almost like a decision tree based approach and a few other uh, techniques that can be used. When we jump into a machine learning, however, the process changes a little bit and that uh, what we need the expert to tell us now is what those cells look like, but not necessarily give me a very defined definition of all of them. Because what we do is we annotate all the different cell types and then we allow our computer uh, or the machine learning algorithms to take over from there. And then the computer will be able to identify the best approach to segment and classify each one of these cells. So the process becomes a little bit quicker and in the end, we have a much more accurate uh, result. Thank you. So let's jump into a few topics today that we're gonna cover. And we're gonna kind of go through uh, a number of different areas that AI can classify for and give you a few examples. So when we think about AI and pathology, right, there's a lot of work that have been done in digital pathology. So I wanna concentrate a little bit on the nuclear detection aspect of all this work, right? There's a lot of challenges in trying to get a very accurate nuclear segmentation when we look at digital pathology. And this is due to the to, to typical variations in the shape of the nuclei, variation in the size of the nuclei, the intensity, and you often have merging and overlapping nuclei. So these are quite a bit of a challenge for typical computer vision work to be able to get a very accurate segmentation on. AI, however, offers a potential to increase our segmentation quality and accuracy by overcoming a lot of these um, differences that we see on the nuclei into a single solution. What we're looking at here is just a, a simple uh, tissue where it was stained with the DAPI, which as you know, detects all of the stains, all the nuclei. 
uh, in this section. And I want to point a couple of things here. So if we look at the red circles, you can see a lot of variation in size and shape of these nuclei. We have large nuclei, small nuclei, um, very different um, looking nuclei. Uh, in blue, we can look uh, almost like the denser, right? We have kind of that donut shaped nuclei that's right in the middle. And then we have some nuclei that are all filled in and some that are kind of somewhere in between the two. The next one that we see is variations in intensity. Uh, some are very bright nuclei, but we also have nuclei that we can barely see on this image. And then again, a spectrum between those two. And then the last one I wanna point out is just those um, nuclei where they're sitting on top of each other or they're kind of merging and overlapping. So all of these pose a challenge to segmentation because it's really hard sometimes to create rules that will really uh, pick all of them individually. However, when we go into machine learning, those problems become a little bit easier to tackle. And here what you're seeing now is the results of what can be achieved with the deep learning solution for those nuclear segmentations. So again, if you look into all of the highlighted areas, you can see that we were able to pick all of those nuclei with a single solution. If we were using a traditional computer vision approach, we would need to have probably multiple rounds of the algorithm and trying to, trying to incorporate all these cells and our accuracy would not be as good as what we see here. So if we look now and take the black away, you can see how we can pick up all of the nuclei there, regardless of shape, size, and intensity. And again, important to highlight that all of this was done using a single deep learning network where we we're able to pick all of the nuclei. And the next image will be just sort of a comparison between, oh, uh, go back one, Mickey. Here, again, just to highlight the two where you can see all of the different shapes, sizes, intensities, merging, and et cetera. So if I leave here for a second, you can see how we can very accurately use deep learning to pick up all the, the nuclei in a much more accurate way. The next image is, again, uh, DAPI stain nuclei, but you can appreciate the nuclei here look very different than the nuclei on the previous image in that the intensities are much more uniform. However, there's a lot of nuclei clumped and bunched together. And again, using a classical approach, it's a little bit challenging to very accurately separate all of these clumps of nuclei. However, when we do apply um, AI to it, we're able to get a much more accurate result and separate the nuclei into its individual components rather than one group of cells and count that as one. Next slide, please. Thank you. And the same holds true when we look at nuclear segmentation in h &E. As you can appreciate, all of those tissues here are gonna have very different uh, shape and intensity nuclei inside of them. So again, using a deep learning solution, we can uh, accommodate all of those and incorporate all of the nuclei into a single solution. And all of this can be accomplished by incorporating more of those annotations into our network and training on specific tissue types allow us to get a much greater accuracy of the nuclear segmentation. And then from that point onwards, any work that we do downstream is always downstream of the nuclear segmentation. So if we're doing a multiplex XA, for example, you know, the first thing is gonna be, let's detect the nuclei and then look at the overlapping channels on the multiplex. So it all relies on having a good quality on our nuclear segmentation solution. Uh, next slide, and I think Mickey, you're gonna talk about these ones. Yes, thank you, Alan, that, that was great. Uh, this is a slightly different project, but still uh, we can start discussing the nuclear uh, segmentation. Uh, what you can see to the left, okay, the blue with the brown stain is the eosinophilus. Okay, it's one of the particles of the blood. And in this project, we were asked to uh, segment uh, this uh, specific particle. Uh, the photos you, you can see to the right are just a black and white image of the segmentation. And as you can see, this is very, very accurate, uh, regardless of the different uh, colors, uh, where, you know, some of it is uh, blue, some of it is uh, uh, white and so on and so forth. The, our AI platform knows how to deal with these uh, things. Uh, this is a slightly different uh, look at the same project. You can see the entire slide uh, to the left. Uh, the numbers are uh, indicate the different particles. We can literally uh, count each and every one of them, okay, and, and show them on this uh, uh, map, so to speak. Um, 
as you can see here, uh, there are different uh, clusters of, uh, of these particles in different parts of the slide, especially on the left side uh, of, the, of the slide. You can see this, this uh, bunch of them uh, over there. Okay, I emphasize that because uh, this uh, project not only included uh, nuclear segmentation, but also tumor segmentation. Okay, and as you can see here, the, the, the more uh, uh, dense areas are in fact areas in which uh, there, were, there is a malignant tumor. Okay, and again to the right, you can see the black and white uh, way of, uh, of presenting it just to make it easier to identify. Now, the nice thing about it is that we can actually uh, do both. Okay, so when we developed this system, it actually included two different uh, networks. Okay, one focused on nuclei segmentation, the other on the tumor segmentation. But with one click uh, per slide, okay, and you can have the entire map, as you can see on the right here, in which the blue dots are the small particles and the gray areas are the uh, tumor uh, areas. Okay, and that was important for this specific uh, customer because he wanted to check the correlation between uh, these two uh, phenomena. Okay, I'm not going to linger over the, the clinical side, uh, but it's a very nice uh, project in the sense that it involves uh, nuclei segmentation as well as uh, tumor uh, segmentation. Uh, so our next uh, thing would be AI in radiology. Again, this is a big thing and tumor detection. We will continue with tumor detection. Alan, you can, you can lead the way. Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, so, you know, when we think about radiology, right, this is another area where there's a lot of potential for AI solutions. Now, when we, you can clearly appreciate there's different areas that we can go into, different tissues, different regions. Um, however, we're going to talk about three specific ones and always concentrating on the on this talk on tumor detection. So one way in which we've successfully used our AI tools have been on the automated um, detection of lung tumors. So one nice thing about the, the, these automated detections is that not only we can detect the tumor on the one image we're looking at, as we're tracking the patients over time, these AI solutions allow us to register the, all the images from a single patient so that we can get longitudinal data to see how is the tumor progressing for each one of the treatments that they have. The next work, um, kind of similar work to the lung, but now we're looking at a liver tumor where, again, we're taking CT-based images and employing AI tools to have an automated liver tumor detection. Uh, and again, advantages is you're not only detecting one tumor, if there's two, three, however many tumors are present in this region, you're able to detect all of them and then present this material back to a radiologist for confirmation. And again, you're able to track your patients over time by having a good registration from um, from scan to scan. Another, oh, there you go. Another area to, to highlight to is on brain tumor detection. So this is another area where AI has been used by us, which was in the successful detection of brain tumors. Um, we're not gonna linger too much over the radiology. I think there'll be some additional webinars coming up where we're gonna spend a little bit more time and, and go over in more detail on some of these uh, AI tools for radiology that we have, but I thought it was important to highlight some of the key, um, key projects that we've done uh, over the past using AI. And if you have any additional questions on any of the radiology or even the digital pathology slides that we showed, please send us the questions. We'll be happy to take them at the conclusion of the webinar. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, another uh, interesting field with uh, with regards to AI is uh, ophthalmology. Uh, let me show you uh, one of the projects that we've done. Uh, this is actually a project that we've done with uh, Tufts Medical Center in Boston, and uh, it's titled Convolutional Neural Network for Classification and Segmentation of In Vivo Confocal Microscopy Images. Uh, this uh, has actually been published. Most of our work is not published. Uh, because we do it for uh, uh, companies and, and corporations and not for uh, medical centers. So, so this is in fact a good opportunity to show you something that you know we can show you. So uh, what you see here are four photos, which uh, are uh, the four layers of the cornea. And in our case, we were interested in the in uh, the one titled B. Okay, subs. Uh, um, uh, 
which is subsidal nerves. Uh, as you can see, the first stage was just to, to classify between them, okay, to know which one is which. And you can look at the sensitivity and the specificity and the area under the curve. The numbers are extremely high. And uh, this, again, was done with the deep learning uh, system. Uh, this is an evidence to, to the fact that the deep learning systems can reach uh, extremely high levels of accuracy. Uh, of course, it changes from one project to the other. Uh, you know, I cannot guarantee this level of accuracy or another uh, but the potential is is definitely there and uh, you can see it here uh, what you can see here is that once we've classified the different layers and we found the layer that we wanted the next stage is to detect and segment the dendritic cells so to the left you can see the original image okay you can see all these white stains over there in the middle you can see the detected uh, dendritic cells uh, as you can see, some of the white cells are indeed dendritic cells, but not all of them, okay? So it's not just a matter of, you know, understanding the, the color or, or something like that. Uh, there's more uh, into it. And to the right, uh, we've just uh, subtracted the, the background, so it will be easier uh, to see. So this is, in fact, what we were looking for, okay? This it was detected and segmented. Uh, the last part was uh, about quantification, okay? And uh, from our experience, we see more and more projects, AI projects that are into quantification, okay? Because even when people think like, you know, they can segment and they can classify themselves, when it comes to quantification, it's very, very difficult for a person to do all these mini calculations and to be sure that he, he does, didn't miss anything and so on and so forth. So many, uh, uh, difficult quantification tasks are uh, thrown at us when we speak to the customers. In this specific case, the clinical approach to the quantification was uh, that the level of the dendritic cells was quantified based on density, area, and perimeter. Okay, the technical approach chosen was to compare between the uh, dendritic cells analysis of an image using deep learning and an image G. A software, which is a semi-manual method. And as you can see again, the numbers are extremely high, both with regards to the density and the area and uh, the perimeter. Uh, again, uh, it, it's not always as high, uh, but uh, such levels could definitely uh, be reached. Uh, if you're interested in that specific uh, um, issue, uh, feel free to look up uh, one of our previous webinars that focused on that uh, uh, research, and you'll be able to learn more about it. You can find it on our YouTube channel, uh, or just you know contact us, and we'll be happy to, to talk to you. Now, we've covered uh, pathology, we've covered radiology, we've, co we've covered ophthalmology, uh, but uh, in addition to these uh, major pillars, I would say, of, 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 uh, of pharma, there are many, many, many other fields uh, that are not necessarily re uh, uh, perceived as uh, related to AI uh, to that extent, okay? And uh, one of the uh, things that we wanted to, to talk about in this webinar was exactly that, that AI could be implemented in pretty much every field in pharma uh, that includes a any type of uh, visual uh, data. Okay, so we're going to show you a few examples of a few fields, uh, but we're also happy to hear your thoughts. Uh, you can, again, send us as questions or comments. You know, this, this really should be a, a discussion, a talk, uh, because one of the, ch the challenges for the industry uh, is to find the right places to implement AI in a, in a meaningful way. And these would not necessarily be the first, uh, you know, uh, fields that you're thinking about. There are many hidden pockets out there that could benefit from AI, and it's uh, uh, on us as an industry, as a community, uh, to find them and, uh, and uh, develop AI for them. So one of the first things we can think about is uh, hematology and blood samples. Uh, to the right, you can see, you know, a uh, general description of all the types of particles you can find in the blood and in blood samples. Uh, each and every one of them is important in a different way. Each and every one of them is important in order to uh, diagnose and, and monitor uh, different uh, diseases. I'm not going to linger over each and every one of them, <clears throat> but I will say that we 
we are definitely capable of uh, seg uh, seg detecting, segmenting, classifying, and quantifying uh, each and every one of them. Okay. Um, when, when we look at it from the clinical point of view, uh, one of the big things these days with uh, with oncology is uh, circulating tumor cells, CTC. Uh, we are actually involved in different ways in this area, okay, just too early to, to disclose details and to show you photos. Hopefully we can do that in, our, in one of our coming webinars. But basically this is a very big thing and the ability to uh, identify uh, uh, circulating tumor cells in the blood is considered to be uh, very important, I would say, this way for uh, early diagnosis of uh, cancer. Uh, And if you are involved in that in any way, uh, please give us a call. We'll be happy to, to help you. Uh, another major thing, of course, is leukemia. And uh, anemia, you can see in the middle, you can see this crescent-looking, uh, banana-looking uh, uh, blood cell, uh, which is uh, indicative of anemia. And again, this is something we can uh, pretty easily uh, detect, segment, and quantify uh, when we uh, use AI for the uh, blood sample. Uh, this is a project we can disclose, uh, so I'll speak about that uh, a little bit. Um, we were asked to provide white blood cell classification. To the right, you can see the different types of uh, white blood cells, and uh, we've done that uh, with a deep learning uh, system. Uh, uh, that we used in order to classify the blood, uh, the white blood cells. And uh, I'm not going to say too much about it, but the recognition rate was above 97%, both for detection and for quantification, which I think personally is remarkable, uh, especially because, you know, I, I, for me personally, it's very hard to to differ between these, uh, 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 these creatures. Um, and they act, uh, so, the bottom line is that both accuracy and throughput wise, the system is much better than a human expert. Uh, and I think it's, it's a very good example in the sense that it really tells you, uh, you know, this is not something people are supposed to do. If we can have computers do it, they should do it and they can. Um, another field is uh, neurology, another uh, big field actually. Uh, there are many types of uh, scenarios there, but I, I can just say at this point that uh, drug development of uh, neurodegenerative diseases often involves uh, dealing with uh, visual analysis of cells. Uh, the number, the, the names of the, of the diseases Um, hello, can you hear You're me now? now? You're back now, Mickey. We lost you for a minute. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so again, we were discussing neurology and drug development of uh, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, such as Alzheimer, Parkinson's, sclerosis, and ALS. And uh, when we uh, look at the diagnosing, uh, diagnos uh, di diagnosing, sorry, these diseases and oftentimes when we want to look at uh, you know how well the patients uh, respond to uh, various drugs then it turns out that these uh, strange looking cells that you could, could that you see there are very much uh, part of that equation okay uh, you could see astrocytes and mycoglia and pyramidal cells uh, many of them look like uh, spiders so to speak and monitoring the length of these of the legs of these spiders and all other kinds of, of really small changes in the way they look is uh, correlative to both, uh, again, the progress of the disease and the response to the cure, okay? Uh, again, we are involved in, in projects like that. It's just too early uh, to disclose anything at this stage. Another thing, okay. 
Yes, uh, melanoma and dermatology. Um, again, very big thing. Uh, when you look at the photos, you can see that actually from a, a computer vision uh, standpoint, uh, it looks pretty much like the nuclei and many other things that we've uh, seen so far. So, you know, the, 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 uh, the ability to, to develop uh, um, networks to or detect, segment, classify, and quantify these creatures is pretty much there, okay? Specifically with regards to melanoma and dermatology, uh, uh, we're talking about high volume screening. I'm not going to linger over it, uh, but you know, maybe we'll dedicate uh, a webinar in the future to that. But you know, this is something that pretty much everybody has, you know, these little stains, and you need to monitor them and you need to track them. And if, God forbid, you have a, a tumor, then you need to grade them. And AI could be very, very uh, helpful uh, doing that in, in high volumes and high levels of, uh, of accuracy. Another thing I'd like to talk to you about is uh, toxicology and preclinical uh, applications. Now, of course, toxicology and preclinical applications are there also as part of neurology and, and uh, melanoma and blood samples and all the other things that we've already spoken about. But uh, from our experience, many times the people who are dealing with the preclinical are just, you know, uh, part of a different unit than, uh, than the ones who are dealing with the clinical side. And, Oftentimes, you know, when I spoke to these guys, the, the first thing they wanted to know is whether AI is relevant for them as well. Uh, and there was this sentiment that, you know, the, the, the budgets are not as high as uh, in the clinical side. Uh, so I told them, and I'll tell you, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, the the costs of a customized AI uh, solution of customized AI solutions are very much uh, relevant for uh, clinical and also for preclinical applications. Okay, so don't think uh, that uh, you know this is out of your reach. Um, so that's one thing. Still, uh, there there. Are all kinds of um, characteristics that are uh, very much uh, relevant for the preclinical applications. Uh, one of them is, of course, the high volume. You have more mice than people in these uh, 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 trials. Uh, so the number of animals is, is very high. The number of tests that they need to go through is, uh, is also high. And so is the number of dosages, okay? So when you add up the numbers, you get really high volume of, of tests, high volume of images. And the higher the volume, the more it makes sense to use AI uh, uh, applications. Another thing that I've noticed uh, during these talks is that oftentimes uh, the first stage is that they ask me for a classification of normal versus abnormal results, okay? Uh, and I think this is like a filter uh, that uh, they need in order to take the abnormal results and then have them reviewed uh, manually. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, if I can uh, provide them with 10% of the images, okay, and tell them, you know, you don't need to invest your time in, in the 100% of those thousands of images, but rather you can focus on the 10% and these are the abnormal results, so you won't be wasting your time. Uh, it means a lot to uh, preclinical uh, researchers. And another thing, which is again a big thing, uh, is drug delivery uh, measurements. Uh, as we all know, you know, these days, it's not only about administrating uh, the drug. It all, it's also about you know how well uh, does it is it is it delivered uh, uh, to the right place in the body, the right organ, the tumor itself, and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, we want to make sure that it's not uh, uh, harmful to other parts of the body. Uh, these things are often uh, uh, often re require uh, you know visual. Uh, measurements and this is definitely something that you can do with uh, with ai yeah make it just to add to the slide too you know when we think yeah. about um go back to the previous slide when we think about you know the drug discovery process right there's a lot of animal models and a lot of use in target discovery target validation um a lot of different models get developed for for diseases like ibd or or multiple sclerosis models so all of those animal models all of those works typically will have some sort of image component uh, to it as one of the readouts and because we're dealing with very high uh, numbers of animals as we go through these studies having an ai solution there 
could be really uh, efficient and, and a huge time saver, as well as be able to notice and pick up some of the minor differences that can be seen there. Uh, even when we think about some of the behavioral models where there's a camera attached to, to the rats and observes the behavior over time, a lot of those could be built into AI solutions. So really, there's a whole wide area of ranges where AI solutions and, and computer vision can come into play and help in, in those. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Alan, for this uh, addition. Uh, and I think we've uh, reached the end of our uh, slides, uh, which leaves us a lot of time, which is a good thing. Because again, uh, you know, these were just examples of things we've done and things we're, you know, working on and, and ideas for you to, to reflect on and, and so on. But uh, even more than that, it's important for us to hear about, you know, your projects, the, thing that, the things that you are involved in, uh, your ideas as to how AI could be implemented implemented in, in this field or that field, in this scenario or that scenario. So uh, please do uh, send us questions. We already have uh, several questions. Uh, please do send us more uh, so we can continue the, the, the discussion. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Um, mm -mm -mm. Okay, uh, from computer vision, uh, or I guess for computer vision, how many training pictures are needed on an average? Uh, that's a very good question, okay? Uh, and the answer, uh, sadly, is it depends, okay? I wish I could give you a, a, an easy answer, a simple answer, but that's not the case. It all depends on uh, the photos, okay? What you have there, uh, what you're looking for, what you're, what what are you trying to to solve and and to quantify uh, and it also depends on the on your goals of the project as a whole okay only when we know both these parameters then we can tell you okay for this project and that level of accuracy that you're looking for we would need uh, uh this number and not that number okay so that's that's you know a very general uh, answer uh, we might be able to we might be able to specialize yeah. a little bit on that one too mickey so if you talk about let's say a digital pathology solution where you're trying to quantify a specific biomarker in the tissue so if you're using computer vision without ai to build your initial prototype solution you're probably looking at needing about 30 to 40 images and then after that you're going to be in the you know, one to 200 numbers to be able to validate that solution and make it a little bit more accurate. When we jump into AI, uh, because uh, you're dealing with whole slides, there's so many objects of interest in each one of those slides, we can already start building our prototype solution with much less images. We probably don't need the 40 to build a prototype solution. We probably would need uh, maybe half of that to build a prototype solution. And then we would we, need additional ones to validate. And then depending on the level of validation, if it's going to go into the clinic or if it's just going to be a research use, that validation set can be, again, between maybe an additional 50 to 200 images. Excellent, Alan. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, I'll, I'll add to that that really this is why we, we constantly emphasize the need for a POC. The best way to know, not in general, but exactly how many photos you need is to give us a call sign an NDA, show us the photos, and then we will be able to give you a, a precise number. As Alan said, the numbers are not high and they're definitely not as high as people uh, often think they are, okay? So uh, don't be shy, uh, talk to us and we'll be able to tell you uh, the exact uh, number. Uh, another thing I would add to that is that, uh, as Alan said, you know, it, it often uh, happens in stages, okay? We can start with uh, uh, this number and then move to the other one. And this again gives a lot of power to, to starting the process because many times we start with the customer when he is really at, at an early stage, he only has, you know, a limited number of, of photos. And then as we move on with the, with the POC and we give them the, the V1, then he has the time to uh, uh, aggregate and, and, and have more images and then it, it no longer becomes a problem. Okay. So really this is what we do. We have 
you know solutions to each and every one of these obstacles so uh, don't be shy talk to us and we'll be happy to help you to find out the exact number okay uh, what else are we being asked today uh, uh, um, more or less really. one second how can we deal with okay uh, this question is a good one. How can we deal with heterogeneous data, including images, clinical variables, and, uh, and etc.? Uh, Alan, would you like to take that? Yeah, um, of course, when you're dealing with uh, very heterogeneous tissue and things like that, we really need to have uh, slightly more samples than the normal. And I think that's a lot of times true. Uh, we talked about um, animal models versus human models. So a lot of the, the variation comes there, right? If you're dealing with animal samples, there's not a lot of heterogeneity. Usually you can get around with, we can get away with smaller numbers, but when you're dealing with clinical samples, there's definitely a lot of variation from tissue to tissue. tissue. And unfortunately, the only way around that is to increase your, your slides, increase your data set so that you can accommodate and, and incorporate the changes. Now, when we're dealing with AI too, a lot of times we may not need that many more slides, assuming that within each tissue that we have, we see enough heterogeneity there. So if we're just looking at nuclei, each one of those slides is gonna have thousands and thousands of nuclei. So there's a large number of, of annotations that can be taken from there. If we're looking a little bit more global and trying to pick up tumor regions on the slide, then of course, we're only gonna be able to get maybe one or two different regions for each one of the slides that we're looking at. So we need more samples to accommodate for the heterogeneity scene. Excellent, thank you, Alan. Uh, I see one more question here. Can we use AI for non-pharma applications? Well, definitely, uh, this is just not something that uh, that uh, you know we're here to discuss uh but i will say this uh, ai and computer vision are a technology that is relevant to pretty much everything okay everything you can see uh, as a person uh, in a, in the image uh, ai can can deal with okay and and this is important because because even things that you know are not the first ones to to jump in mind when we think about ai or when we think about ai in pharma it could be very much uh, relevant uh, so again this is just to say uh, ai could be used in many 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 different ways and it's more about you know us uh, bringing up these scenarios and coming up with the with the right ideas uh, uh, for that to happen okay the technology is there the technology can do pretty much everything uh, it's just uh, uh, how we use it and and how original we are and innovative we are in in thinking about it um, okay. yes yeah uh, and I'm wondering if the question too was a little bit related to can we use AI in in the data side of things? And then the absolutely is absolutely is yes, right? So we we really um, work with clients and we have the potential to use AI in two ways here. When we're dealing with these types of projects, on the front end will be the AI to build the computer vision solutions that will give us the the downstream data, and then you can go a step further and apply AI to that data itself. To, to start learning more about the data set that you have. And sometimes you can combine the two and try to use AI to come up with new biomarkers or, or new things that may not have been uh, detected on the tissue first. Uh, you know, Maybe you can use it to identify responders versus non-responders in specific populations before going into a trial. So there's definitely a lot of uses of AI. I encourage you guys, if you have that question in more detail, to reach out because there are areas that we're, we're working on uh, that may not necessarily include just the image that could be helpful to you? I agree 100%. Uh, I think we're pretty much running out of time. <clears throat> so uh, I will thank you all for uh, for joining us uh, uh, today. Uh, I will encourage you to stay tuned for our next uh, webinars. 
Uh, we have another one next week with regards to uh, ophthalmology, and there are others uh, on the horizon. Uh, just uh, follow us on LinkedIn or drop us an email and ask to be notified. Uh, if you have any additional questions that uh, have not been answered during this session, please do uh, 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 contact us directly and we'll be happy to answer. And again, the whole idea of this webinar was for us to understand the, the potential of AI in various fields in the pharma business so you know think about your field think about your scenarios the things that you do and if you think uh, you know uh, AI could be helpful or if you're wondering if it is if it could be then just uh, you know pick up the phone drop us an email and uh, we'll be happy to take it from there so uh, thank you very much Alan it's been a great talk and thank Thanks, you Becky. everybody cheers thank you everyone bye-bye